Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar on Breaking Bad Habits, Integrating Crop Diversity into High Tunnel Production Systems by Carrie Rivard of Kansas State University. I'm your host, Alice Formiga from eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and they can all be found on our website at extension.org and on the eOrganic YouTube channel. This webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to find the recordings in one to two weeks on the eOrganic YouTube channel. The webinar will last about 45 minutes and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, feel free to type it into the Q&A box and we'll be reading them out loud after the webinar is over. So today, I'm very pleased to welcome back Carrie Rivard of Kansas State University, who presented a webinar with us several years ago on tomato grafting. His research program focuses on high tunnel production, and he oversees the hightunnels.org website. So welcome, Carrie. We're very glad to have you with us today. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and you'll be able to share yours. All right, great. Well, thanks, first of all, Alice, for inviting me and, and hosting me here on the e Organic webinar series. It's um, a pleasure to be here and talking with you about high tunnels, which is one of my favorite uh, topics to talk about these days. Um, what I'm hoping to share with you today is, is really a culmination of research projects that we've been doing over the years here at Kansas State University. Uh, and, and the hope is that we've been able to put, put together a framework, uh, really an economic framework, for how growers can develop systems that utilize diverse cropping uh, production within them. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and, and get into that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. As, as Alice mentioned, um, I am located out at Kansas State University. I'm not actually at the mothership in Manhattan, um, but I'm located at a research station just outside of Kansas City. So if you ever, ever get a chance, uh, feel free to come out and visit us. We do have a number of high tunnels out there. Um, we do have certified organic land as well as uh, conventionally raised land. And we really manage about 75 to 80 acres or so uh, intensively and then have a lot of woodland and, and pasture as well too. Uh, so as Alice mentioned, we, we do a lot of work in high tunnel production systems. Here you can see our three season high tunnels on the left uh, and then our more traditional four season high tunnels on the right. We also have some caterpillar high tunnels that are not, not shown here on the screen uh, and a new movable high tunnel, which we'll show you a, a picture of here in a little bit. Um, and we also do publish quite a bit of our work through the hightunnels.org website. So if you get a chance, uh, check out that website. There's also a listserv where you can sign up uh, to be on the high tunnels listserv. Right now we have about 900 or so folks from across the country uh, many of them organic, uh, although not all of them are, um, on this listserv. And there's questions about anything from, you know, what, what do you guys think about this supplier for a high tunnel structure to, you know, what are the best varieties of kohlrabi to plant in your high tunnel, right? So that's a really nice resource where you can connect to other growers. Uh, and we did a couple of years ago with some support from the Organic Farming Research Foundation add an organic section to the hightunnels.org website. And so there's some good information in there about you know, things to think about how to get your actual high tunnel structure certified organic, uh, dealing with treated wood and, you know, some of those questions that oftentimes come up. Uh, and then last but not least, I just wanted to point out as well that uh, here at K-State, we have a, a really nice team of faculty members that are doing work in this area. And I'm sort of the, the production guy on the team, um, but we have this urban food systems group, including Dr. Eleni Pliaconi and Candace Shoemaker uh, and Jeremy Cohen as well. And so, you know, one of the things that we see is our growers, our urban farmers, as well as uh, rural and peri-urban farmers are really adopting high tunnels at a very quick rate. Uh, and so we, we're trying to put a focus on doing research projects that surround high tunnel production and not just comparing indoor versus outdoor production, but really trying to get at some of the production methods, uh, the varieties, <clears throat> the crops and the economic costs and benefits of using these high tunnel systems in general. So this is a, a nice picture. This is a buddy of mine back in Pennsylvania um, who, who grows two acres of multi-bay uh, high tunnels. And, and you can see that this is grown basically in a monoculture. Um, but to most farmers, this is exactly what we want to see, right? This nice, beautiful, lush high tunnel full of tomatoes, uh, full of potential revenue and, and hopefully profit uh, that will become very useful for that, that grower. Um, but oftentimes, you know, what happens is you have your first year and you get a great 
tomato crop and you say, oh, let's do that again, right? And then maybe the next year, oh, let's do that again. We're still paying off that high tunnel. And as a tendency, what can happen is growers can think about either limiting their crop rotation intervals or just eliminating them altogether. And one of the things that I think we're finding now that we've been using tunnels for a few years is that this can be, you know, potentially problematic uh, decisions. So oftentimes when we reduce crop rotation, we can see scenes that are a little bit more like this, right? And so this is the end of the season in that same high tunnel. Uh, and there was a lot of disease, a lot of fungal diseases, uh, as both soil-borne diseases as well as leaf blights and stem blights uh, that cause a lot of problems for that grower. And this particular grower, grower actually ended up uprooting his entire two-acre high tunnel and moving it to another location on the farm uh, because this, this challenge of growing tomatoes year after year for 10 plus years uh, really overtook uh, the, the, the high tunnel. So what we're trying to do now is try and put growers in a position where they, where they don't have this. And the reality here in Kansas, we don't have a lot of growers that are growing at this scale. Uh, many of our growers in Kansas are really producing for farmers markets and CSAs and small restaurants. And so they're looking for diverse uh, high tunnel production systems that have you know, multiple types of crops, multiple things going on within them. We're also seeing a lot of growers in Kansas that are scaling up their high tunnel production. So maybe rather instead of having one high tunnel that's got a diverse group of blocks of crops within it, um, actually having four or five high tunnels that they're actually rotating uh, crops through. So what is the purpose of crop rotation, right? That's the first question. Uh, and it really comes back to crop rotation being, you know, one of the primary components of an integrated pest management system. Um, we know about crop rotation uh, and its benefits for two main ways. One is that if you continue to grow the same crop year after year after year, you're gonna have issues with soil borne and, and especially root infecting pathogens, right? So these are your pythiums, your fusariums, your rhizoctonias, uh, things that, can, that are gonna enter the root system or maybe the stem uh, and don't typically fly around in the air. You know, they don't sporulate and blow around with wind currents. Um, so, you know, this can be a potential issue if, if you have inoculum from uh, sclerotium ralsii that gets dropped in the soil and the next year you plant a host um, of that same pathogen, then you're going to continue to spread disease and you'll see things like uh, the sclerotium uh, lettuce wilt drop on many different types of crops as you continue to do that over time. The other thing that can be an issue if you're not using crop rotation is just general fertility management. Each crop is going to extract a specific profile of nutrients out of the soil. And especially when you're talking about minor nutrients and micronutrients, um, you know, oftentimes some crops really need a lot of potassium or need a lot of calcium. Uh, and so if you continue to do that over time, your, your fertility uh, issues are going to get a little bit wonky. And so that's another reason why we really like to rotate crops over space and time. But what's the challenge in a high tunnel? The, the challenge in a high tunnel is that We've spent a bunch of money to build this structure. This is now our most valuable real estate on the farm for many of our growers. And so they feel like they need to offset those costs. And because of that, we see the most valuable crop being tomato as also being uh, the crop that's grown the most frequently. And there's a lot of surveys that have been done over the years that have shown that data point several times over and over again. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a tomato guy myself, um, but it's important to recognize the value of that crop rotation. So there have been some economic studies that have been published on the actual fixed costs of the high tunnel structure. And these include um, not only the material costs for the frame and the plastic, uh, but also the labor to put the structure up, also the labor to maintain the structure over time. And then all of these things are annualized over the lifespan of whatever specific component of that. So in the case of the frame, it would be annualized over 10 years. Uh, in the case of the baseboards and sidewalls, you know, oftentimes those are four to five years, depending on how long they can last before they need to be replaced. And at the end of the day, what we found is that it basically costs somewhere between 44 and 49 cents per square foot per year uh, to maintain the structure of that high tunnel. Uh, and this, you know, again, has been published a couple different times with a couple different um, high tunnel structures uh, being used as models. So what we have to think about when we're developing a crop rotation is we have to be able to offset that 44 cents per square foot per year in order to pay off that high tunnel. 
And I think growers are excited that tomatoes can oftentimes pay off the material cost in a single year, and that's awesome. But when we think about the value of soil health as it's, it's a long-term investment, um, I think it's okay to, to stretch out the value and the, and the cost of that high tunnel. So the Kansas Rural Center uh, is a non-for-profit group here in, here in Kansas, and they actually put together a nice publication called uh, Growing Undercover. And this is actually the second uh, volume. They have volume one and volume two. And in the second volume, uh, we were able to bring together a bunch of economic data from, from several different kinds of crops. And you can see those listed here. Um, now, it's important to point out that this is gross revenue per square foot, not profitability. Um, and that's going to be important as we continue this story as well. But what you can see is that tomatoes bringing in definitely the most money per square foot at $3.66. Uh, bell peppers is number two at $2.30. Um, and then the list kind of goes on from there. Now, when we talk about crop rotation, we want to think about rotating across entire plant families, not, not specific species of plants. So within the solanaceous family, is peppers, tomatoes, Irish potatoes, and eggplant. So if you rotate from tomatoes to peppers, you're not really gonna gain very much because oftentimes the pathogens that attack tomatoes also attack their cousin, the pepper. Okay, so in terms of disease management, you wanna make sure that you're rotating across entire plant families and not just specific species. Uh, now this gets difficult in high tunnels if you start thinking about some of the cool season crops in particular, Right now, we really only have two main plant families that we're actually using uh, for cool season crops. And so that's one of the things we're gonna have to think about as we move forward um, developing production systems for high tunnels. So this is a picture from Peregrine Farm. This is an organic farm in North Carolina. And I used to work with these growers quite a bit uh, back in the day, Alex and Betsy Hitt, I think are getting ready to retire is my general understanding. Um, but they had a really innovative way of developing a crop rotation at their farm. And I just wanted to explain it real quickly. So they were using these multi-bay high tunnels. Um, and you can see these here. This is about a half acre of high tunnel. Um, obviously this is a pretty inexpensive high tunnel, um, but it's big enough it, it allowed them to develop a crop rotation within it. And one of the things that they did is they used a lot of cut flowers and then rotated those with heirloom tomatoes. But what was really interesting about what they would do is they could rotate within that tunnel for three to four years, and then they actually owned another set of legs for that high tunnel, so they could literally move the entire high tunnel over to the land just to adjacent to it off to the right of that picture. And so that was a really nice way for them to not only, they were rotating within the tunnel, but then they increased their overall land space and allowed them to, you know, allow that soil to go fallow for a couple of years um, and increase the crop rotation interval dramatically that way. And, you know, we're not going to talk at all about cut flowers today because that's not really my specialty. I'm more of a vegetable person. Um, but I would encourage you to look into growing cut flowers as a potential rotational crop. Uh, for the hits, it worked really well for them in North Carolina. Um, and I think that's a nice high value crop. You can grow a lot of dollars per square foot uh, with cut flowers that can compete with tomatoes. Um, and it also provides a lot of value and, and could potentially diversify the market. So the other thing that the, they had at Peregrine Farm was one of these mobile high tunnels. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. This, this is Ethan Coleman's original design uh, where it was basically on a wooden track that was a homemade high tunnel. And you could use basically a tractor to slide that tunnel back and forth. And so this again allows you to have more space that you're covering uh, and, and increase those crop rotation intervals um, without having to actually reduce the amount of square footage that you have in production. Uh, we actually just recently built a mobile high tunnel out at the research station. This is a Rimmel tunnel and the folks at Rimmel were kind enough to donate it to us. Um, and you can see this is a little bit more modern version of the same thing. Um, this, is, this tunnel is actually pretty unique. Uh, we had the Rimmel folks actually custom weld the rails uh, onto metal piers and then we made a, a concrete uh, footing for the tunnel and, and as a result there's a whole bunch of benefits in terms of holding the structure down and keeping it more protected from storms and wind damage but the other thing that you can see here is that because you've now made that rail nice and solid um, you can actually move a greenhouse with just a couple of people uh, now I will admit this greenhouse right now is actually moving just slightly downhill and that's a very important detail 
uh, if you're trying to understand how two people can push an entire greenhouse. Um, but when we push it back up the hill, it takes four people. So, you know, that's one of the things that's kind of unique. The nice thing about using movable tunnels is, again, it just gives you more square footage um, to implement your crop rotation. And so you can suddenly really dramatically increase the interval of the crop rotation altogether. So one of the other things that we do in our, our lab is we do a lot of work with grafting uh, tomatoes with interspecific rootstocks. Now, in the case of grafting, we're typically using rootstocks that are an interspecific hybrid, which means they're a cross between a wild species of tomato and a domestic species. And there's actually some rootstocks out there that are crosses with cherry tomatoes, um, but most of them are crossed with wild species like, like a Persicon, Persudum, and, es and uh, Habercades. And so this can be one way you can actually increase a small um, but not insignificant amount of diversity into tomato production is just by using grafted plants because it does allow you to introduce and rotate some of these actual rootstocks without having to change the scion variety. Now we have seen examples where using rootstocks can functionally work like rotation. Um, so, you know, if you think about disease management, one of the primary goals of crop rotation is that if you don't have a host, then the uh, pathogen is not able to reproduce on your host and therefore put out a greater population at the end of the season that could potentially cause a problem next year. Um, now in the case of root knot nematodes, this is a very specific pathogen. Um, nematodes are submicroscopic worms and they are obligate biotropes. And what that means is they actually have to have a living host in order to reproduce. And so in this case, you can actually implement what are called major gene resistance. And this is not GMO resistance, this is done with traditional breeding um, that actually doesn't allow the nematode to reproduce on these resistant rootstocks. So although this is not crop rotation, it does function in that way because it limits the population increases of these nematodes. So you can see here in this uh, data that big power is a rootstock that we found uh, it seems to really work well in terms of keeping the population levels down of nematodes. Whereas we did actually find other rootstocks um, that actually provided those um, ability for those nematodes to reproduce, even though they didn't inhibit yields. So if you do have nematodes, that can be one example where rootstocks can function like crop rotation, but it's important to keep in mind that it, it's not the same thing as crop rotation. Now, if, if this is something you have an interest in, we've, we've generated a lot of information about uh, rootstocks and have done a lot of rootstock trialing. And, and I will say that, you know, in, in order to think about it this way, in terms of limiting plant population, sorry, plant pathogen population reproduction, um, then you wanna look to find rootstocks that have what we call major gene resistance. And so if you open up your, your seed catalog and it says better boy VFN, that V stands for major gene resistance against verti verticillium welt race one. The F stands for major gene resistance against fusarium welt race one and N is for nematode. Okay, so it's only gonna help you with those diseases where we have actual major gene resistance available. And so it's just important to, to mention that. So keep in mind that we can use rootstocks to function like crop rotation, but it's really not the same thing. And especially when you start talking about the benefits of soil health and soil fertility, um, obviously we don't want a, mo a monoculture where we have grafted and then non-grafted plants. That's not gonna be something that's gonna be sustainable in the long term. Um, now this is a grower in Kansas that we work with a lot and he's in North Central Kansas and he has actually about a dozen high tunnels. Um, and, and Dan is a really progressive grower. He's a really innovative marketer and, and does a really nice job with his uh, tomatoes and his high tunnels. Um, right now, I think he's got about 10, maybe, maybe seven or eight, upwards of 10 of those high tunnels with tomatoes in them. And he is using grafted plants. Um, but this was during one of our extension field trips. We went out there to visit him and talk to him about some of his soil health uh, practices. And we were we got done with our presentation, uh, you know, here in the high tunnel, and then we started walking down the row, and I noticed this one high tunnel that had all these funky things growing in it, right? Um, and so I started quizzing Dan about, you know, why in the world would you plant bush beans uh, in a high tunnel? You know, that just doesn't seem like something that's going to add up in the long term, economically speaking. And so one of the things that Dan and I talked about is he was really interested in trying to develop some rotation, some more rotation options in his tunnel. 
And so you can see he's experimenting not only with green beans, but also strawberries and cucurbits. Um, and you know, even at the level when you, when you have 10 or 12 high tunnels, that crop rotation becomes even that much more important because uh, his investment in those 12 high tunnels is huge. And his oppor opportunity cost, if he has a big disease problem or something like that related to crop rotation is even more important. And so, you know, it was kind of an eye-opening experience for me talking to Dan um, about it. And it, as it turns out, it seems like actually bush beans could be a viable crop for some growers. Uh, you're able to get a nice early crop. They're beautiful quality. They're a short season crop. And so you can get in and out very quickly. Um, but it's not something we would traditionally think about seeing in high tunnels. <clears throat> so what about cover crops? We're also doing a lot of work right now uh, looking at the integration of cover crops and high tunnels. Uh, this is obviously sort of a cheater's way of including uh, cover crops. This is um, some of our high tunnels at the research station. And at that time, we, didn't, we actually didn't use them for two complete seasons before we had a chance to get enough projects to fill all our tunnels up. And so we just put them into rye and took the plastic off. And you know, if you have the ability to actually take your high tunnel line of production and, and put it in a cover crop, I would highly recommend you think about integrating that into your crop rotation because the, the leaching that happens from that, that precipitation and that rain is gonna be really important. And of course, growing a cover crop is a nice way uh, to help feed the soil microbial biology, as well as add some organic matter and, and other essential things to the soil. But I think for most of us, you know, we want to keep our tunnels covered, you know, uh, 12 months a year in order to keep them productive. And so we're looking more at, into cover crops that can grow in a, a relatively short window. Um, now, this is a, a, a high tunnel that I used to work at, worked in in North Carolina. And we did some research there uh, looking at the use of cover crops, um, especially as a way to provide uh, fertility in the form of nitrogen to the following tomato crop. Um, now, tomatoes typically like about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And so what you can see and uh, see here is that this high tunnel, uh, by growing that rye cover crop and vetch in the off season, we were able to produce about 83 pounds of available nitrogen for that tomato crop. And so in that case, you know, to have over 80% of your fertility come from a cover crop is an important thing. Um, but again, in this case, we're growing cover crop during the winter time, which for many growers, I think is the most uh, valuable time to use the high tunnel when you can grow those cool season crops. So, you know, we're looking now into, into doing some other short window cover crops where we're looking at, at the use of summer cover crops and fall and winter killed cover crops uh, as well. And this is all being supported right now by an OREI grant uh, that's led by the University of Minnesota and Julie Grossman's uh, shop up there. Um, and then we're also collaborating with the University of Kentucky and, and Krista Jacobson's lab uh, over there in Lexington. So this has been a really fun project to, to work on. Um, and we've been looking at not only the sort of agronomic side of, of cover crop production, but also the economic side. And so we've been working with a uh, ag economist up there in, in Minnesota on that. So let's talk about some of these projects about uh, that we can use to actually build a profitable crop rotation for a high tunnel. So one of the things that we've been doing for the last five years is just general variety trials uh, on tomatoes as well as bell peppers. And so we've been able to accumulate quite a bit of data over the last five years in terms of how productive our, our peppers can be uh, in the high tunnel system in Kansas. Um, we're mainly focused on green bell peppers in these particular variety trials. You can see some of the varieties that we've grown. Um, you know, we've got a few that are continual uh, high performers like um, Declaration and Alliance. Uh, and then we've also, this work has been really nice because we've been able to collect some background yield data about, you know, how productive these plants are over the long term. So we took that yield data and basically transcribed it to um, the percent marketability that we're getting, normalize it with uh, even size high tunnel, uh, and then tried to multiply it by the the typical sale price for peppers in our region at farmers markets. And I will admit this, this sale price is not based on certified organic produce. This is actually more so uh, just local farmers markets that are in the Kansas City metro region. And some of those include organic growers and some of them do not. Um, and we found that basically we can grow about $2.17 per square foot uh, by growing bell peppers. Okay, so that's, that's useful information. As I mentioned before, 
bell peppers aren't really a crop rotation option for tomatoes because they are in the solanaceous plant family. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, so the next project I'm going to tell you about is really related to growing day neutral strawberries in high tunnels. And this is this was one of the uh, important projects, I think, for the development of this presentation is looking at, at day neutral strawberries and really spring planted strawberries in the high tunnel. And we did this work from 2014 to 2016. Uh, and Kelly Goody was the graduate student that worked on that. And she's currently a PhD student right now uh, at K-State Olathe as well. So as most of us know, in the, the typical annual um, strawberry production system, where people use varieties like Chandler and Camarosa and some of those kinds of things, uh, they're gonna plant those in the fall. Uh, here in Kansas, we'll actually put row cover over them for the entire winter, and then we'll harvest them in the spring. And this is what you would think of as your typical open field uh, strawberry production system. Okay, so what we wanted to do in the high tunnel was change it up a little bit because Obviously, if you're planting in the fall and not harvesting until spring, you've, you've got a huge opportunity cost uh, in the production space during the fall and the winter where you could be growing greens and cabbages and uh, you know, all kinds of other things or cover crops for that matter. And so what we were trying to do was look at the use of day neutral spring planted strawberries in our high tunnel. Um, and this tunnel was uh, not certified organic, but it was managed organically. Um, we did actually play a little bit around with evaporative cooling where we would actually turn on overhead sprinklers for five minutes a day at noon. Uh, and the idea with that is basically as the water evaporates off the plants, it takes heat energy with it. Uh, one of the challenges for growing strawberries here in Kansas in the summertime is that it gets very warm uh, here in Kansas and especially in a high tunnel, uh, that could be a big issue. Now we are lucky in Kansas that we have a lot of wind, so we have good, good ventilation. And you, you can probably see from this picture uh, just on the right hand side that we did have shade cloth on this tunnel. So there was 30% shade uh, is what we were using. So this is the yield data from the first year and what you can see, you know, I know this is very messy slide, uh, but I think what's, what's nice about the way this data is presented is you can really see the, the peaks and the valleys of the production over the course of the summer. So we, we planted this trial on April 7th. Um, and by the 15th of May, we were already getting pretty good harvest out in the high tunnel. So, you know, again, just about five weeks uh, until we, we got that first crop. Uh, those king fruit, which is what we call them oftentimes in strawberries, are the biggest, most beautiful ones. And we had a, a nice productive May. Um, but what's impressive with these day neutral berries is that they also will keep producing through the summer. And so we had pretty high yields in July as well. Um, and then they'll oftentimes peak a little bit again in the fall although the grad students don't like that particular one. So um, in 2015, we planted a little bit later, uh, but you can see in April 21st, uh, and we got our first you know, good yield about the first of June. So again, somewhere in that five to six week range from the time that we planted these as plugs, uh, sorry, as bare root plants uh, to the point that we're getting that first harvest. Uh, in the second year of data, you can see a little bit more of that flush that we get in the fall with the, with the strawberries. Um, and, you know, that's one of those things that can also be kind of weather dependent and is somewhat labor dependent. Uh, people get tired of picking strawberries after a while uh, and they, they, they want to kill the trial, right? Um, so we were able to get some good yield data from this trial. Uh, and what we found is that um, Portola is one of the better varieties uh, for growing day neutral strawberries uh, here in Kansas in the high tunnel. Uh, but then we were able to take that data and extrapolate it into some economic data. And again, this is just using gross revenue. It's not profitability, but it is gross revenue um, because we're wanting to compare it back to the tomato at $3.60 per square foot. Now in our case uh, with these strawberries, they were fairly productive. Uh, most, most growers in our region uh, assume that if you can get a pound per plant uh, out of an open field strawberry, then it's basically paid for itself economically and that you're, you're making pretty good money. Um, in the high tunnel, we've, we got about a pound and a quarter per plant, upwards to 1.4 pounds. Um, and so we were encouraged by that, um, but we, you know, we were a little discouraged by the actual dollars per square foot uh, in this particular case. Strawberry is a very high value crop. Um, and so you know, I think that could be a potentially a nice way uh, to really increase your per square foot revenue within the tunnel during the high, within the high tunnel during the summer. Um, the other thing that I would add related to that project is you can see from this picture, um, we were not using 
the full square footage of the high tunnel. And I think we actually have submitted a, a proposal um, more recently to try and follow up on this work and, and especially looking at plant density um, because the way strawberries grow, we probably easily could have put double the number of plants in that high tunnel uh, than we did and, and probably increased our per square foot revenue quite a bit. The other thing that Kelly did when she was working with these strawberries is look at the fruit quality. Um, one of the challenges, or one of the things that we could thought could potentially be a challenge with growing strawberries in the summertime uh, is that when you have warm evening nights, oftentimes the sweetness and the sugar levels of those fruit is not as high as when you have cool evenings. And that's one of the reasons why strawberries do so well, uh, you know, in the Western US. Um, but, but one of the things that we found is that, you know, compared to our spring planted varieties, we still had relatively good levels of uh, soluble solid content. Um, and in general, we also did some, uh, some taste testing, uh, consumer taste testing that went over very well, of course, with our master gardeners and other folks uh, in the community um, to be able to get eat fresh strawberries at the end of July in Kansas is a pretty difficult thing to do. Um, and, and the consumers really enjoyed the strawberries. So we feel like um, at least with the two years of data we have, um, we're able to show that that hopefully won't be an issue. Uh, Kelly also did some work just looking at quality of the berries as well too, um, and found that you know Seascape and ED2 didn't have quite as good a visual quality as some of the other varieties. Um, but again, that's probably a little more detail than you're looking for. So we've talked about bell peppers now, we've talked about strawberries. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, cucurbits, in particular cantaloupe and watermelon. Um, this is another crop, if somebody came up to me and said, you know, I'm interested in growing watermelons in my high tunnel, I would say, well, why in the world would you wanna do that, right? <laughs> um, because we, we typically think of vining crops as not providing a lot of dollars per square foot in gross revenue. Um, so we decided uh, with the support of the Kansas Vegetable Growers Association to do some variety trialing where we could, we could identify potentially varieties that might do well in the high tunnel, but again, hopefully generate some baseline data that we can use to make economic projections uh, on, you know, how relevant is this as a rotation crop as compared to tomatoes. So, you know, these were pretty uh, basic trials. We're just looking at six different varieties. You can see, uh, in this case, we were using seedless uh, watermelon varieties, uh, and we were using pollinators, and we would basically plant a pollinator every five plants within the high tunnel. Uh, with a cantaloupe, um, again, these are some pretty standard open field varieties, and we basically used uh, two halves of one very long 24 foot by 200 foot high tunnel to do this work. Um, and you can see we, we didn't plant them super early. You know, I think a lot of times people are looking for season extension with the use of high tunnels. Um, but in the case of cucurbits, they're very sensitive to cool soils. Uh, and in this case, we we're using a three season high tunnel. And so the soil temperatures wouldn't be quite as warm as they would with a four season high tunnel. Um, but you can see some of the cultural methods we use. Uh, we pretty much did the same thing between both the, the cantaloupe and the watermelon. So here you can see a picture of it. Um, one of the things that we figured out uh, through this experiment uh, is that if you want to do a variety trial with melons, you're gonna have to trellis them in a high tunnel. Um, now, as it turns out, as a grower, I don't know that trellising is necessarily the way to go, um, but all of these vines just grew together into a complete and total mess. And so, unfortunately, we weren't able to get plot level data to identify the differences between the varieties. Um, but what became really apparent really fast is we could actually just get aggregated data of the total yield that was coming out of this high tunnel for both our cantaloupes and our watermelons. And as you can see, we had a really nice crop. Uh, one of the things that was amazing is how long that crop held on even after we started harvesting them. <clears throat> so here you can see some of the data from the cantaloupe. Uh, we basically uh, harvested about 3,300 pounds of cantaloupe out of uh, a 24 foot by 100 foot section of high tunnel in this case. Uh, it was kind of a, a, an interesting story. Um, we donate about 99% of our produce gets donated to a non-for-profit group here in Kansas City who actually distributes it to food pantries. Um, and we were able to get our first harvest on June 30th, which is actually quite early for cantaloupe uh, here in the Kansas City area. And so I thought it was kind of cool that the, the, the food pantries were actually able to get their hands on some fresh cantaloupe, uh, maybe even before the grocery stores were in that case. So that was kind of fun. 
Um, but basically what we found with our yield data is that we were able to generate somewhere around 90 cents per square foot uh, of revenue uh, based on a selling price of 50 cents per pound or 54 cents per pound, I should say. And again, that's a conventional price. That's not an organic price. So, you know, in terms of your own farm and your own thinking, you might be plugging your own numbers uh, into some of these, these figures here. Um, but 90 cents per square foot, obviously that's nothing close to the $3.66 that the tomatoes provide, but it does provide some revenue and, and then is definitely double uh, the revenue that goes into this, the structural costs as well. So it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, with the watermelons, again, we also had a very productive season in the high tunnels um, and basically found, you know, that we, we got about the same dollars per square foot uh, in terms of production. So we got about 89 cents per square foot. Keep in mind that with watermelons, you have to, with seedless watermelons, you have to plant these pollinator varieties. And so that's going to take up some real estate within your high tunnel. And there's probably uh, ways to reduce the number of pollinators and some, some research that could be done. But, you know, overall, you probably wouldn't be increasing your, your per square foot revenue by a whole lot, uh, even if you got rid of them altogether. So the last project I'm going to talk about uh, is this um, organic sweet potato slip project. And we, we're just finishing it up now, actually. Um, Zach Hoppenstad was a graduate student working on that, and he just graduated uh, this past summer at K-State. Um, and, and he was able to do some, some nice field projects, uh, both at our Olathe Horticulture Center and down at the uh, Wichita Research Station, uh, just south of Wichita, actually, in Hayesville, Kansas. Um, if, in case you didn't know, the John C. Pear Center there in Hayesville, they actually grow certified organic slips um, for sale to growers. And, and so they have a lot of equipment, a lot of knowledge um, about growing sweet potato slips. And so we're really, we're really happy to collaborate with that group uh, down in Wichita on that. So as most of us know, uh, sweet potatoes are propagated, right, by basically long stem cuttings uh, that are grown early in the spring. And typically, um, these are the, the nurseries where sweet potato slips are propagated are in the southeastern portion of the U.S., uh, places like North Carolina and Louisiana and, and some of those areas down there. Um, and it's where you can plant early enough to basically sprout the tubers uh, and then you the slips are cut by hand oftentimes, uh, and, they're, and, and at least at John C. Pear, they're packed into boxes and then shipped uh, to growers to be planted somewhere in the neighborhood of June 1st to July 15th. So what we wanted to do with this project is say, if, if you're a sweet potato, organic sweet potato grower here in Kansas, um, you know, maybe rather than trying to buy in slips from North Carolina or some other state in the Southeast, uh, you could potentially actually propagate your own slips in the high tunnel and sell those to other growers in the area or at least use them for yourself. So this project, you know, it's, I just wanted to clarify, it's really not about growing sweet potato tubers uh, in the high tunnel. It's really about growing sweet potato slips as a propagative material uh, that, again, you can sell to other farmers in the area or potentially use for, for your own sweet potato production in the open field. So... What we do with sweet potatoes is essentially bed the tubers uh, sort of as early as we can um, and then cover them actually with plastic and those tubers will send up shoots uh, that you can see grow to about 10 to 12 inches and then will get harvested as slips. Um, so we basically did that both within the high tunnel as well as the open field um, and we're able to look at the yields in the high tunnel versus open field as well as some other things in addition to that. Um, now, we had a little bit of inconsistent data between 2016 and 2017. In 2016, we had actually much higher production of slips in the high tunnel compared to the open field, whereas in 2017, they were pretty similar uh, across the board. Um, but uh, one of the things that we found is that planting density can have a, a big impact on not only the number of slips that are produced, but also uh, the quality of those slips. In other words, you know, how long they are, how many inner nodes there are, how much leaf mass is on them, um, the things that can potentially contribute to yield as they get planted in the open field. So one of the things that Zach found uh, was that the 65 seed root per square meter density, which is the middle one we are testing, you can see here on the right, actually turned out to be the optimum planting density uh, for growing sweet potato slips. The other thing um, that we were mainly just curious about uh, because we had the data 
um, is we found that actually the, the seed weight is in many ways more important than the seed number. So there's this general assumption out there in sweet potato land uh, that if you plant a, a, seed, a sweet potato tuber, um, it's gonna send out you know, eight or 10 slips, a, a, a discrete number of slips. Um, and one of the things that we found is it's actually more related to the weight and the size of the tuber uh, than it is the, the number of tubers themselves. And I think most of us would think that would be fairly intuitive you know, as a sweet potato has more storage carbohydrates within that tuber to send up slips, uh, it's gonna produce more than one that's smaller and doesn't have as many carbohydrates to back that physiological mechanism up. So that was kind of an interesting finding, but probably not as important for, for those of y'all that are interested in growing these. Um, so as acted a, also, as I mentioned before, was able to look at the, the quality of the slips as well, the length, the stem diameter, uh, we measured things like compactness and res robustness um, in order to try and determine some of the actual quality of the slips grown in the field versus the tunnel. Uh, and it, then he actually did performance studies in the field where the slips that were grown in the high tunnel uh, were compared with slips that were grown in the open field when we think about yield um, of the actual sweet potato tubers through the course of the year. So we, re we repeated this twice using slips from both the Hayesville Research Station as well as the Olathe station, and then did that actual trial in both places as well. Um, and what he essentially what he found is there really wasn't much difference um, between the yield of the slips grown in the high tunnel versus the field. Um, now you can see there was some numerical difference, um, but it, but that wasn't statistically significant. Here you can see Zach on his last harvest day. For those of you that have never done a master's thesis before. The last data point that you ever collect is probably like your the happiest point you've ever had because, and that's the 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 experience that Zach is having right now. He doesn't have to collect any more data. He's almost done with his thesis. So, in terms of some of the results of that sweet potato work, uh, we found that there actually might be a new king in town. Uh, first of all, when it comes to revenue per square foot, now I should mention that this number here of four dollars and thirty cents is really from the first year of data not so much the second, um, but we, 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 he actually did a, a full economic analysis of this work, including profitability, um, and found a lot of really interesting findings from that. Uh, but, but what I wanted to point out here uh, was that, you know, if you get a good high yield of sweet potato slips um, grown in the high tunnel, you're actually gonna bring in a gross revenue of $4.30 per square foot. Uh, and that's, you know, whether or not that's opportunity costs of money you don't have to spend buying them from somebody else um, or potentially selling those to you know, farmers that are in the, the region or in the community. Um, now, if you're interested in this work, we have lots of other findings, but I did just wanna highlight that, um, you know, it does look like there's other ways to increase that gross revenue. Okay, so we're, we're starting to get um, close to, whoops the end of our time here, but I just wanted to kind of put some of these pieces together for you. Um, you know, so obviously this is the scenario we don't want. This is when we're planting tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes after tomatoes. Um, and this is gonna be things that are gonna lead to disease in the tomato. Uh, and the long-term sustainability of the, of the high tunnel uh, is gonna be an issue. And so we really wanna discourage you from thinking about doing that. Um, now there's some small things you can do, right? You can utilize cover crops in the off season if you have that uh, ability, um, or you can use grafted plants to slightly diversify your high tunnel. Um, but I think we want to start thinking bigger and thinking about, you know, true alternatives to, to tomatoes. So we talked a little bit about strawberries today. Um, now in our case, we raised about $1.76 per square foot. So not as much as that three sixty-six, dollars um, but it's still a pretty good revenue. Um, and I do think that with more research on planting density, there's probably ways to increase that number as well. We also talked about melons, and in this case, we're really starting to stretch our margin now because we're down to 89 to 90 cents, again, per square foot in gross revenue. Now, it's important to point out that there's not a lot of work that has to be done to melons, so the, the, the production expenses uh, are relatively low compared to many of these other crops that we're talking about. And the other benefit of growing cucurbits, um, whether they're melons or cucumbers, is they're a shorter season crop. And so suddenly you have this little window available to try and stick in a summer cover crop for four to six weeks um, to further diversify that tunnel as well. Uh, and again, it doesn't have to be melons. You can think about growing other cucurbits. There's um, a group up in 
at Cornell that's looking at, at, at zucchini and squash and how uh, squash bugs can be impacted by growing under the high tunnel. Um, a lot of people I know, uh, growers have a good luck with some of these English cucumbers and other things. Uh, obviously with cucurbits, you always want to think about pollinators. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, many of our growers in Kansas are using parthenocarpic varieties uh, that where they don't necessarily require a pollinator, or you can actually buy bumblebees and just put them into the high tunnel as well. That's a, another potential option. Uh, now this example is actually from a grower uh, down the road from us, um, and they actually are growing what I would call specialty cut flower, these purple and yellow cut flower, and they get a premium price for them at the market. Um, and, and that grower and I sat down for a minute, we said he gets about a buck and a quarter per square foot. And again, this is another shorter season cover crop than tomatoes. Um, and it also allows you, and that allows you to put some kind of cover crop into the summer afterwards. And then last but not least, we talked about sweet potato slips. And again, I don't think everybody should go out and start growing sweet potato slips because there's gonna be a saturated market really fast. Um, but this is a very high value crop you can grow during the summer. Uh, it loves the warm weather in the high tunnel and it, it, it matches really well with the timing of when you would typically be planting tomatoes, which makes it nice for a crop rotation option. Now, one of the things that we found with, with sweet potatoes uh, is it is important to get those tubers out of the tunnel um, because they can be problematic, not only for just growing biomass, but also for attracting bulls and other rodents. And so you wanna be really careful about that. Once you're done with the sweet potato tubers, dig them up and, and get them the heck out of the tunnel. Um, but you know, what I hope you can think about doing in the long term is, is really putting all these pieces together and developing a, a six year crop rotation. And it doesn't have to be exactly what we have here. Um, this is just, this is the way we did it with the projects that we have. Um, but I think each grower knows their market. They, they wanna grow different types of crops. And so they can think about developing these six year crop, rot crop rotations that'll hopefully be more sustainable in the long term. Um, and you know, I think the way to think about each one of those potential cropping systems is think about the revenue that comes in, right? Think about, uh, now in this case, we're talking about per square foot revenue, not necessarily profitability. Um, and it is important not to discount the importance of profitability. Um, but if, if we're just trying to compare tomatoes to other crops, um, then you know, a square foot, per square foot revenue is a, a good place to start. And so what I did here was I basically just applied some economic data from the Rural Center's publication, as well as uh, the data that we've generated from our research trials. And what you can see is that over the course of the six years, we actually have an average annual gross revenue of $4.09 per square foot. Okay, so that includes, that does include cool season crops, um, and you can see in a, a couple of those years, um, but it also includes cover crops as well too. Um, and basically our overhead structural costs for that tunnel, remember that we started out at 44 cents to 49 cents per square foot per year, is about 11 cents of that gross revenue, and sorry, 11% of that gross revenue. And so I think that's a pretty good starting point. If you can pay off your high tunnel with 10% of your crop, uh, then hopefully you should be in pretty good shape. The other thing that's nice about diversifying in this way is you can think about the timing of you know, pest cycles, but also labor. You know, there's going to be, in order to keep a, a crew busy, uh, you don't want to be planting everything all at once, right? You want to be staggering the plantings of your different crops uh, in order to keep them uh, busy in the tunnels. So just to kind of wrap things up, if, if you haven't figured out by now, one of the things I'm really encouraging folks to do is to not be growing tomatoes year after year. You can potentially use rootstocks as a way to help diversify, um, but it's, it's, it's not going to functionally compensate for lack of rotation if you're just using rootstocks, right? We need to think about developing new systems. Um, the day neutral strawberries is something that looks like it could potentially work in, in our part of the country. Uh, depending on where you are, that might be something else to look into. Um, and again, sweet potatoes uh, slips has been, seems like it has a, a lot of potential um, for helping people increase that early season revenue. Um, and then even some of these lower, sort of lower value crops like melons, you can grow the most beautiful, delicious cantaloupe in a high tunnel. Um, and even if they don't have a high dollar per square foot value, they can still bring in value in terms of attracting customers to the market and those kinds of things. And again, you don't really have to, you know, the goal of this presentation isn't to try and convince you all to grow this exact rotation that we've developed, um, but think about structuring your rotation in the same way that we have. So you can recognize the value of the crop rotation over the long term 
Um, and then you can find your individual niche. If you want to grow ginger, if you want to grow, you know, some of these other fun crops that people are experimenting with uh, and, and sort of create your own niche and your own market that way. So I appreciate your all's attention today um, and I would be happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, somebody did ask if you could just go back and show the six year rotation slide again that you had, sure. um, you know, even though you were talking about how people need to tailor it to their own systems. Um, but I think people were interested in just getting a better look at that. So sure. we'll just leave that up a little longer here. Yep, no problem. And um, yeah, for anyone who joined us a little after the webinar started, um, you can type in questions by using the Q&A box on your screen. You can also use the chat box. And um, we'll be reading the questions out loud until we run out of time. And if you don't see the Q&A box, there should be a bar with some controls at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on the Q&A one, that ought to pull it up. Um, I also wanted to mention that we recorded this presentation and you'll be able to find the recording in about a week uh, or maybe give us two weeks because we have a lot of recordings to process right now, um, but two weeks at most on the eOrganic YouTube channel. Um, we'll also be sending you a follow-up survey by email later today, and we'd really appreciate your feedback. So we have quite a few questions coming in here. Um, and um, okay, so one person was wondering about um, how in a number of the images you showed landscaping material in the aisles between the rows um, or bare earth. So have you found um, landscaping fabric to be the best practice or is a green um, cover crop mulch um, worthwhile? Well, I, I think it depends. That's a great question. Um, I think it depends a lot on the crop that you're growing, the time of the year, all those things. So, you know, for vertically trellis crops like tomatoes and cucumbers, uh, I really like that fabric. It keeps the weeds down. Um, it, it, we've actually, you wouldn't think it, and if you walk in a high tunnel, um, but we've actually done quite a bit of soil temperature monitoring, uh, and that, that fabric will actually keep the, the soil a little bit cooler during the summer than it is if it's bare ground. Um, and, you know, I just really like fabric because it keeps keeps the weeds from coming up. We don't have the time to go through and, and weed by hand or use our scuffle hose in those crop areas. Now, I will say that, you know, for our spinach, um, not all of them, but I think oftentimes for lettuce and certainly for baby greens, uh, people like to use bare ground systems. And, and in those cases, um, you know, bare ground may be the best. So it's going to kind of depend a little bit. Um, there is more and more interest in using cover crop as a, you know, like we've done a lot of open field work where we grow a cover crop and roll it down and use it as a mulch. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in doing that in the high tunnel right now, but I see more people interested in potentially like bringing in, you know, cover crop mulch like straw or leaves or things like that to use as a biodegradable mulch. And I have a lot of interest in and trying to do more work um, in that area because I think there's a lot of potential there for sure. But but we haven't really used any any uh, rolled down cover crops in our high tunnel at this point. Okay, um, will using a rye cover crop from October to April be a substitute for in season crop rotation? So I think it's an interesting question about whether yeah, or not. That's yeah, <laughs> that's a great that's a great question. Um, so the the thing that we want to try and do is increase the crop rotation interval between, you know, for example, tomato crops um, so that there's three years between tomatoes. And, and the reason that we do this is the basic assumption is that especially with fungal plant pathogens, there's a lot of fungi that will produce, you know, more or less overwintering structures uh, that can last anywhere from three, you know, with verticillium, it's the case, all the way up to 10 years uh, in the soil community. And so, the longer interval you have, it's, it's not really about the fact that you've slipped a crop in between. It's really about the fact that you've got as many years as possible between each tomato crop. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, okay, so um, if you're rotating crops within the tunnel, how far do they need to be moved for soil borne diseases to be mitigated? Yeah, that's, that's another good question. So the physical space. Um, with most of these soil-borne plant pathogens, these aren't going to sporulate and blow around in the air. Their, their entire life cycle uh, occurs within the soil, right? And so, you know, they will move a little bit, um, but not very much. Uh, one of the things you probably want to be a little bit more careful with is the, the best way for them to move is actually, you know, through your tools, right? Your, 
tillers or scuffle hose or whatever kind of equipment you're using in that tiller in that high tunnel could potentially transport pathogens around. So, you know, if you are rotating within, you know, four beds in a high tunnel, for example, it sounds a little bit OCD, but I would actually consider, you know, maybe washing, you know, spraying off your tiller before uh, you till beds, you know, two different beds to try and prevent that cross contamination. Uh, but you're, you're really not going to see very much physical movement by the pathogen within the soil. I mean, a, a nematode is one of the fastest moving pathogens we know about, and it can move about a meter per year. Okay, so, yeah. you know, the physical space between those beds can be pretty small. Okay. Um, you mentioned ginger at one point, and we have someone asking whether or not you have any experience with disease in ginger in high tunnels. And if anybody wants to chime in about that, um, you can use the chat box and there's a little option, a little drop down next to where you want to send it to copy all the attendees. So if you want to share any information on that, but do you, Carrie, have any experience with ginger diseases? Yeah, I got to admit, I would love to hear other people's thoughts on that because I, I really don't have any experience with ginger. We have a, a, numer a number of growers in the area that are experimenting with ginger and, and growing it. I know, I, I'm sorry off the top of my head, I can't remember, but there are a couple fungal, maybe a virus disease uh, that gets in ginger that can be pr a problem, but I, I don't have any specific experience with it. Okay, if anybody has any experience, feel free to chime in on the chat box and copy all the attendees as well as the panelists. Um, okay, you showed a slide with cut flowers and someone wanted to know if you're growing Lysianthus for sale. Uh, we are not, um, you know, I, my work is mainly with vegetables, uh, but I've seen a lot of um, growers be really successful growing Lysianthus uh, for the farmer's market, absolutely. The nice thing about them in the tunnel is Lysianthus is such a delicate flower mm -hmm. <laughs> that especially here in Kansas, I mean, they just don't survive in the open field for very long. Uh, and they, they, are, they will extend the length of the stem a little bit by growing it in the high tunnel. And I think there's specific varieties that are supposed to be used for cut flower Lysianthus that, that also have a little bit longer stem. Um, so those can be helpful as well. But yeah, I've seen a lot of people be successful with it, but we haven't really grown them ourselves. Okay. Um, can you list some different cover crops that you use for different seasons? Yeah, sure. So um, we're, we're doing the experiment that we're doing right now. It's, it's really three experiments in itself. So we have a cover crop trial set up for the overwintering season, for the summer, and for the, um, what, we're, what we're calling the winter kill period. So this would basically be uh, late fall going into December where those cover crops would potentially get winter killed. Uh, and you wouldn't have to have equipment to terminate them. So for our summer cover crops, we're looking right now at the use of millet. We're looking at the use of sorghum Sudan grass. Uh, and we're looking at the use of buckwheat. Um, and then we're doing that with combinations of um, cowpea uh, as our legume. Um, and so we'll, I have a graduate student, uh, Ashley Skinner, who's working on that project right now. Um, and she's finding some pretty interesting results um, so th those are our summer cover crops. Um, during the fall or what we call the winter kill period, uh, we're using things that get winter killed in Kansas. So that includes oats, uh, it includes uh, barley, um, and we also have uh, millet in that one as well. And then we're also combining that with um, cowpea. Now during the overwintering period, you have a little bit more flexibility uh, with what you're doing. And so um, in our case, we're looking at rye, we're looking at triticale, um, and we're looking at a few other things. Uh, and, we're, and we're also looking at wheat. So either three of those can be nice for grasses. Um, and then we're combining them with hairy vetch as our winter legume. And that hairy vetch is always a, it's a good biomass producer in the late season. It produces a lot of nitrogen, um, but it has to go through the winterization period before it really starts growing. Uh, one of the other cover crops we've grown a lot in the winter in our high tunnels is Austrian winter pea. Um, and Austrian winter pea is nice because it grows a lot of biomass. It is a legume. Um, and then you can actually, if you want to, you can even harvest the shoots uh, and take them to market if you want and, and get a little bit of money back from them.
Okay, um, someone very kindly um, put in the comment that Virginia State University, VSU, has some information on growing ginger as well as turmeric in high tunnels. So I don't have a direct link to send, but if you um, type into a search engine, Virginia State University and uh, growing ginger and turmeric in high tunnels, um, probably something will come up. So thank you very much for that comment. Um, okay. Um, Let's see, more on cover crops here. Could you include the decrease in fertilizers, fertilizer expenses due to cover crops? Um, you said they can provide up to 80% of fertility needs um, in the $4 per year that you quoted towards the end. Yeah, so um, you keep in mind that $4 per year is just gross revenue. So it, it wouldn't exactly fit into the gross revenue. It would just be less expenses. Uh, we're, we're working with an economist right now at University of Minnesota a lot on this question of cover crops and economics. And, you know, I think one of the things to keep in mind is, is to answer your question, yes, obviously you're going to spend less money on fertilizer if you can cover 80% of it uh, with a cover crop. Um, but the reality is, like in, in our case, we're comparing the use of vetch cover crop to um, growing spinach during the winter. And so if, if the choice is between growing spinach and growing a cover crop, uh, you're actually gonna bring in a lot more money with the spinach crop than you do with the cover crop. Um, and so it's what we're really trying to document with this experiment right now is, is actually the opportunity costs of using that cover crop in, in regards to not being able to grow a winter crop and in our case, that's spinach. Um, but, you know, I think, the, the thing that's always important to remember is we right now as researchers don't have a good way to put a dollar value on soil. Um, and it's something that I think we need to work on and, and we're kind of working with this group at Minnesota right now to try and figure out how to do that. Um, but you know, if you think about the potential revenue from a high tunnel for the next 10 years, right? Add all that up and then think about how important every square centimeter of soil is within the high tunnel, um, then, you know, maybe the opportunity cost of not bringing that spinach money back in is maybe a little bit more valuable to you than the dollars that it brings in, right? So it's good to, to think long-term in that way. Okay, we have um, several people asking whether it might be possible to share a slide handout on the webinar archive page. Um, would that be okay with you or? Absolutely, yep. yeah. Okay, so basically on, um, if you just, um, Google webinars by eOrganic, um, and then you go to this webinar, um, we'll, we will load the archived recording as well as a handout of the slide. So thank you very much for that. And I will also try to send people a link to the slide handout when I send out the link to the follow-up survey today. And that way, all of you will get it in your email. So yeah, that, that's wonderful. Thank you, Carrie. Um, so um, we have a lot more questions coming in here. So I'm just kind of taking them as they come here. Have you tried running small livestock after the cover crops? Or do you know of anyone who has like lambs followed by chicken? Yeah, so, you know, I'm, I'm a vegetable guy. I, I have done that in my personal uh, farming adventures, not so much in a high tunnel, but in the open field. Um, and certainly there's potential there. We, one of the things we're gonna need to be careful about with high tunnel systems is um, you know, the food safety side of that question. Uh, now, according to GAPS and, you know, what we're now perceiving is FISMA, uh, we generally want 120 days before manure is deposited until you harvest another crop. And so if you think about, you know, I pulled out my sheep or my chickens 120 days before it's harvested. Technically, according to GAPS, I think that's probably what most inspectors would tell you is allowable. Um, but keep in mind that the environment within the high tunnel is quite a bit more protected than in the open field. And I would, I would just be skeptical to err on the side of caution with that practice because, you know, our assumption is that it takes 90 days for E. coli to break down in the open field. But we don't really know if that's the case in the high tunnel. It may be able to survive longer. And so if you are going to do that, you know, you just want to make sure you have a, a nice nice long breakdown period uh, between when the, the animals leave and, you, and between when you harvest those crops. 
Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, so when you are cleaning your tools, do you just wash them or do you use some sort of soap? Yep, you can just wash them. It's just fine. I mean, you're, you're really trying to get after weed seeds and pathogen spores. And with the exception of a very, very few, you know, biofilm examples and stuff like that, if you can get the soil off of the, the tools, then it'll take the pathogens and weed seeds as well. Okay. Um, regarding landscape fa fabric, um, what is the density or mesh size that you used? Yeah, you know, I haven't, I've never seen it listed as mesh size, but they usually actually sell it in, in how long the fabric lasts. So they have five-year mm -hmm. fabric, 10-year fabric, 15-year fabric. Um, we, we tend to get the five-year fabric for the stuff, basically the stuff that we have holes in where the, the crop is actually planted. And then for our walkways, we'll use the 10-year fabric. Uh, and then in our sort of construction projects, like the leg rows and underneath the baseboards, we'll use the 15-year fabric so we don't have to replace it as much. Okay. Um, we got a question about whether you can successfully grow ginseng in high tunnels. I don't see why you couldn't give it a shot, but to be honest with you, I'm not sure I could answer that question. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and for the six-year cycle on that um, rotation slide, do you have dates listed for those? Uh, I mean, there are not dates listed right there, okay. um, and they're going to change depending on what hardiness zone you're in. Right. So it, I will say the way I, I developed that, it's all kind of relative to the tomato. <laughs> so, you know, if your planting date for tomatoes in a high tunnel is April 10th, you know, you might think about just putting that there and you can kind of figure out the other crops based off of that. Okay. Um, okay, here's someone who points out that many growers only have one to two high tunnels. What, what, what do you think about crop rotation with a limited number of high tunnels? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that's the case here in Kansas too. And, and like that picture that I showed um, all the way at the beginning, um, you know, I, I, I think that you can rotate in blocks within your high tunnel. You don't have to rotate the entire tunnel. Uh, there's going to be some logistical issues that come up. You know, you start thinking about trellising tomatoes or, or sorry, trellising cucumbers or staking tomatoes or, or whatever it is if you have trellis systems. Um, that you'll want to think through a little bit. But, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, most, most of these soilborne plant pathogens don't really get very far in the soil. So, you know, I think you're still going to get overall the same benefits by rotating within the high tunnel as you would across high tunnels. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions about salt buildup in high tunnels and how you manage that um, from soil applied nutrients, or is it not an issue with crop rotation? Oh no, it can definitely still be an issue. Um, and, and I'm glad somebody brought that up because soil salinity can be a big problem in high tunnels. Um, so, you know, as most of us know, because the tunnels don't, aren't exposed to rain, um, then there's, there's very little soil leaching that happens within a high tunnel. Uh, and as a result, fertilizer salts can build up. Um, and we're not just talking about sodium chloride, we're talking about other ionic salts as well um, that can lead to poor productivity by the plants. So, you know, ways to mitigate that, um, the, the, the most obvious one is to leach the soil. And, you know, I have heard of growers like literally flooding their high tunnels to try and leach it. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if that's the best practice for your overall soil health, because at some point it, that, that soil is going to go anaerobic and that can be a problem if you're doing that. Um, but but what we've had pretty good luck at is, you know, just opening the tunnel up if you can take it out of production for a spring or a summer or fall or possibly even a whole season uh, and, and opening up that cover um, during the off season so that you can get some precipitation to help with that leaching. Um, the other thing is I think, you know, the, the soil salinity issue is, is a place where we really just need to be proactive. And the, the reason why a lot of people are having uh, high EC in their soils and their high tunnels is because quite frankly they're over fertilizing right and and oftentimes people you know because a high tunnel is the most valuable real estate on the property it's like why not just put a little more fertilizer in to make it that much more productive and, and ensure you have high heat high yields um, but the, the flip side of that is that if you're over fertilizing and you're in a system that doesn't have leaching you're going to quickly build up those fertilizer salts so making sure you're very specific with the fertility you are adding 
um, using cover crops to recycle those nutrients as opposed to just keep adding more, I think is in the long term probably one of our best solutions. Um, but you know, we gotta we gotta navigate our way through the economic side of using those cover crops. Um, but you know, and then using things like fertigation so that you can spoon feed small amounts of fertilizer uh, over the course of the season. And you know, just by using fertigation, oftentimes you can cut down the the level of fertility you're adding to your plants by you know 30 to 40 percent. Um, because because you don't lose it uh, in other ways. So th those can be some practices, but I really think it's a big matter of just being proactive and trying to prevent over fertilization and using any alternative to fertilizer that you can. And that includes alternatives to composts and manures too, because composts and manures can be um, you know, very detrimental to the soil if they're overused. Okay, um, one of our listeners um, nicely included a link to the Virginia State University ginger and turmeric information and they do recommend it as a crop for high tunnels. So I put that link into the chat box. Great, um, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, thanks to the person who put that in. And then also, um, okay, we have another question from someone who said that in the Pacific Northwest, their local strawberry expert said that we should never follow solanaceous plants like tomatoes with strawberries due to verticillium wilt. He said the strawberries are very sensitive to it much more than tomatoes and I assume peppers. So is this not an issue in your region or your trials? Yeah, so the, the disease that's being referred to there is verticillium dahlia, which is a fungal plant pathogen. We actually, we do not have a big issue with verticillium on our strawberries in this part of the country that, I've, that I'm aware of at least. Um, we do sometimes, we will see it in the tomatoes, um, but it, it doesn't, you know, maybe it's just because we don't have enough people growing strawberries in the area, but right now we're not identifying that as a potential problem. Um, but that's certainly something to keep an eye on. If, if you have verticillium delia uh, in your area and it's something that's prevalent on strawberry crops there, um, you're going to want to keep an eye on that and, and maybe not follow tomatoes directly with strawberries, but you could move it somewhere else in the rotation. Okay. Um, has any research been done on using bush beans or peas as a nitrogen fixing product for both sale and cover crops? Yeah, I mean, not, not really that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't been done. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good information out there in, from the open field uh, that could probably help inform that question. But I, I don't know of, you know, anybody really experimenting with some of those lower value crops and high tunnels right now. Okay. Um, let's see. This person has had a problem with grasshoppers in high tunnels after yeah. a cereal rye cover crop. How do I get rid of grasshoppers? Oh, grasshoppers are the worst. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny because we get degrees in plant disease management and managing insects. And then the, my biggest problem at the farm are grasshoppers and four-legged critters like rabbits and voles and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, so yeah, grasshoppers can be really problematic. We used to have a lot of issues with them um, at our research station. And one of the things that I found has really cut down um, uh, that the severity of that problem for us is actually our mowing practices around the area. So, you know, we used to, <laughs> when we didn't have as much help, quite frankly, uh, I would let grass get tall around the high tunnels and we didn't keep things weed eated and we you did a lot of that, you know, kind of stuff. Um, and our research was still doing great, but once you got outside the high tunnels, everything was kind of shaggy. Um, and in the last few years, we've done a lot better job managing just literally the grass and the turf areas around the tunnel. Uh, and it has significantly reduced the pressure of grasshoppers uh, for us. And I've talked to some other folks about that. And I think other people find the same that if you can you can literally just keep the grass down in the landscape, um, then you can help keep the, the grasshoppers at bay. Okay, um, can high tunnels be used to mitigate climate warming? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I would, if somebody asks, if you said climate, so, uh, you know, we're all into different names with that topic these days. Um, I, I definitely think there's a viable way for high tunnels to help us survive the effects of climate change. Um, and we're seeing that in the Midwest as strong as anywhere. We just had in the past year, we had our hottest, sorry, our coldest April, our hottest June. Uh, we've had more snow in the last six weeks than most years we have in two winters combined. 
Um, and so we're seeing all this erratic weather patterns uh, here in our area. And one of the nice things about tunnels is, you know, they just prevent that thermal mass around the plant, that microclimate around the plant that can help temper the effects of those things. And, you know, all it takes is one hailstorm to blow through Kansas to destroy a lot of dollars worth of lettuce. Um, and oftentimes it will destroy a few hundred dollars worth of plastic on a high tunnel, um, but you can save the crop that way and still, still get to market. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I think to answer your question, um, I do think that, that high tunnels definitely will play a role um, in an environment where we have a continually erratic weather as a result of climate change. Okay, we have time for one more question here. Um, let's see, there was one more question. Okay, yeah. Um, what do you think that the, what big differences um, do you see in implementing this system in organic production, advantages and disadvantages? Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely gonna be a, a few different numbers, as I mentioned in the gross revenue there. Um, the, the slips and, well, anyway, not all those numbers came from conventional, or sorry, from organic um, sales prices. Um, but in, in general, I think most of the, the stuff we've talked about today uh, can be fairly easily implemented into organic systems. One of the things that we find um, that's nice about a high tunnel, and the way I kind of got into them as a plant pathology student um, was in that, in that microclimate, not always, but oftentimes you have less pressure from uh, foliar diseases, things like leaf spots. Um, we're also seeing that with certain insects, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's necessarily less pressure, but the pressure is different. Um, now in some high tunnels you have uh, with certain crops, you have maybe higher pressure with insects like aphids and spider mites can be a real problem um, for uh, uh, many, many people. And so you want to be careful there. But I think by and large, uh, most of the stuff we're talking about today can be easily applied to uh, organic growers. And, and, you know, for what it's worth, even the, actually the, the trials that we have that are, um, have conventional uh, prices attached to them. We're, we're actually using organic practices to grow all, the, all those crops. Um, so, you know, in terms of our insect management and those kinds of things. So there's certainly crops that could be readily adopted into an organic system. Okay, thank you everyone for all those great questions. So thank you so much, Carrie, for a great presentation. And we hope that everyone online can join us for the many other webinars that we have scheduled this season. There's one tomorrow by Mark Schoenbeck on um, nutrient management. And um, you can find all of our webinars by searching in your browser for webinars by eOrganic. So thanks again, Carrie, and thanks to everyone for joining us. All right, thank you so much.